In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our text is taken from the Gospel lesson for this day. I invite you to join with me in reading the words of the text on the screens. People will come from east and west, from north and south, and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first, and first who will be last. People of God, people whose faith is in Christ Jesus the door. Mission unexpected, mission impossible. Walking along with Jesus. That's what the Gospels invite us to do as we read and study them. And as we read in the Gospels, uh, we're invited to be one of those in the crowd among his disciples who's walking in the presence of Jesus. As we read through the Gospels, we are given the opportunity to uh, overhear conversations that Jesus is having with people, uh, to listen to his teaching, <clears throat> and to see the fantastic things that he is doing as God is working in our world. But then as we see these things, as we hear these things, suddenly Jesus turns to us, looks us straight in the face and in the eyes, and says, Okay, how are you going to respond to me? How are you going to respond to what I'm telling you and showing you? As we walk, walk alongside with Jesus, we discover how often Jesus took a variety of questions and quite often didn't answer them in the way that people expected. What Jesus often did was took questions that were brought to him and he reframed them and directed them into an entirely different level and uh, sometimes a much deeper meaning. And so the text that we have this morning is actually an end of a discussion that Jesus had with the man who came with a question. And the question basically was this. Uh, will only a few people be saved? Will only a few people be saved? Now, we don't know the man's intention. Uh, perhaps uh, he was thinking uh, only the children of Israel will be saved. Certainly not all of these Roman soldiers and all of these other people who are occupying the nation. Uh, maybe he was thinking of uh, himself being so righteous and saying uh, only the righteous will be saved. Only people like me who live as good as I am. Certainly not all of these inferior unrighteous sinners uh, that uh, fill our society. Or perhaps he was just uh, interested in a bit of a theological discussion, uh, kind of like people talking about the latest blockbuster movie over a cup of coffee at a, a Starbucks. But what we see in this particular event <clears throat> is how Jesus takes the man's question and then reframes it until it becomes something very, very personal. In effect, he's telling the man and all the crowds that were around him, uh, don't be so concerned about numbers. Don't be so concerned about how many are going to be saved. Make sure that you're saved. Make sure that you're saved. And you can only be saved by walking through the narrow door. That's the only way that you're going to be saved. But once you walk through that narrow door, you are going to be absolutely amazed at the vast number whom God is saving. You're going to be absolutely amazed at the tremendous number of people that God is saving. So your job is to keep your eyes on the narrow door. A door and a narrow one at that. Now that goes against a lot of the thinking in our world today in our society. Uh, our society, again, like other cultures and in the past, very often adopts its own doctrines and creeds, uh, things that it strongly believes in and accepts as absolute truth. And uh, there are many in our society today uh, who have adopted the doctrines and creeds of inclusion and diversity. And what is behind these particular doctrines and creeds is that everybody has a right to their own opinion, all opinions basically are the same, have the same value, 
Everybody has a right to live the life that they want to live because after all, it's our life and we are to do what we want with it. But those who so boldly proclaim inclusion often draw the line on those whom they exclude. For example, <clears throat> often the newly born, about or a nearly born, who live in the womb are excluded <clears throat> in that inclusion process. Uh, very often, the attitude uh, is everybody is included, except those who don't believe with or agree with me. So even in a society where so many people follow the doctrines and creeds of inclusion, uh, we still find that uh, even though they say they don't like doors, they still establish doors. They still establish doors through which others have to go through. Now on the opposite side in our society are the exclusionists. Uh, these are the ones who so quickly and completely exclude others on the basis of uh, such things as color of skin or cultural background <clears throat> or a variety of other issues that are usually on the surface rather than deep within. And as we examine the history of our nation, <clears throat> we can find that some of these groups, such as the Ku Klux Klan, have misused Jesus and the cross. They have used the Jesus in the cross as a way of exalting themselves and proclaiming themselves to be superior to others. What they do is <clears throat> they use Jesus to slam the door shut on large groups of people, to slam the door shut on people that they think are inferior or unworthy. But in today's gospel lesson, we find that Jesus has extremely harsh words to say about those who claim to know him, who say that they've rubbed shoulders with him and that they've heard his teaching, but to them Jesus says, away with me, away with you. I don't know you. I don't know you because you really do not know me. And so in the gospel lesson, Jesus shuts the door on them. I can imagine a white supremacist standing before the Lord Christ on Judgment Day. And Jesus says to them, Hi, my name is Jesus. I chose to come into this world as a Jew. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And suddenly all feelings and thoughts of superiority are gone. The only exalted one is Christ Jesus. The only exalted one is Christ Jesus. And we are all on our knees asking for his mercy. Inclusion, exclusion. Uh, there are people in our society who have sworn their allegiance to... Uh, to those kinds of doctrines and creeds. But one of the problems still lies that even when they religiously follow their beliefs, they still have no escape from their sin. They still have no escape from the power of death. They are running into walls. They are running into walls that they cannot go through nor overcome. They've closed the door upon themselves. Now, God has an entirely different plan of separation and inclusion. And uh, God makes it known throughout the scriptures, uh, from the very beginning to the end, that God wants all people to be saved. He wants people of every nation, every culture, every area of the world to be with him in eternity. And occasionally the scriptures will... Uh, give us an opportunity to uh, look through a small window and peep into eternity and to see what he has prepared for us and for all people. And today's text is one of those particular small windows. 
as Jesus teaches, people will come from east and west, from north and south, and feast, take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. But it's basically a saying they're going to come from all, all over the world. All over the world. And they are going to be involved in this huge banquet celebration where they enjoy the abundant goodness and love of God. Uh, several weeks ago, Jane and I were invited to a wedding, and uh, after the wedding was over, reception was held at a different area from the church. And we went to the reception area. We're waiting for the bridal uh, group to come, uh, the party to come, the wedding party to come. And so we're standing in this room that's very small, uh, very crowded, uh, wasn't decorated very nicely. Uh, we were packed uh, almost shoulder to shoulder with a whole bunch of people that we didn't know. There was conversation and confusion all over the, all over the place. And then someone came, opened the door and said, come on in. We walked through the door. Wow. I mean, it was, it was totally different than where we had been. This huge banquet hall filled with light, decorated, and just waiting for people to come in to celebrate and to enjoy. And I thought to myself, what a difference it makes to go through the door. On the one side, drab and dreary, confusion. On the other side, absolutely bright and beautiful and such a tremendous experience. What a difference it is when we go through the door. Now, Revelation 7, verse 9, gives us another glimpse into eternity, another one of those small windows. And in that particular verse, God the Holy Spirit is taking St. John, uh, the disciple, and he is giving him, uh, bringing him into the presence of those who have now gone ahead of us. Who are, and this is what they're experiencing. This is what the uh, people are experiencing right now on the other side of the door. And St. John writes of this particular experience in this way. He said, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, standing before the throne of God in front of Jesus the Lamb. What a picture. Do we get the picture of what's beyond the door? Inclusion. Inclusion, total inclusion, far beyond all the divisions and all the restrictions that we experience in this world and in this society. Total inclusion. That's God's desire. That's God's plan. That's God's goal. But total inclusion, God's plan of total inclusion begins with total exclusion. No one regardless of their nationality, race, color, culture, religious, or secular beliefs, no one can escape from their sins on their own. No one can claim their superiority, their own righteousness, their own rightness before God. No one can conquer the power of death. On our own, the door is shut and locked tight. That's the reality of our situation. It's a reality for everybody, for all those who strive for inclusion, for all those who strive to be superior to others, and for all of us in between. Eventually, we are all, every one of us, confronted by a closed door. But thanks be to God, he has opened a door that we can never open our own. It's a narrow door, but it is a doorway that has an entrance, that is an entrance and an exit. It's an exit from our sin and death, an entrance into God's forgiveness, his righteousness, his eternal life. It's the narrow door of the suffering, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, the Son of God. And it is the only door, the only door. But fortunately, it's a doorway that is available so that everybody can go through and go into the other side. Now, the gospel lesson for this morning <clears throat> begins by telling us that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. 
The reality is the destination of Jesus was far more narrower than Jerusalem. He was on his way to the cross. He was on his way to the cross. He knew that the mission that God the Father had given him was the cross, and he headed to that door, the narrow door of the cross. You see, the cross upon which Jesus was nailed wasn't probably very big. It was just wide enough for them to extend his hands out and nail him. Uh, it certainly was not as big as this cross here. It probably was tall enough only just so the enemies of Jesus could put him on display. They wanted to display that he had been defeated, that he had been conquered, that he was a hopeless mess. But he actually was tall enough to display the tremendous love of God. The incomprehensible love that God has for us so that he would defeat the power of sin for us. The cross was a narrow door that Jesus had to go through. But there was another door that Jesus also had to encounter, and that was a solid rock door of the tomb. And that was a door he tossed aside, opening a door into eternal life for us and for all people. The mission of Jesus was unexpected and seemed to be impossible. At least that was the perspective of many people. It continues to be the expectation or perspective of many people today. Why would God want to sacrifice his perfect son for such sinful and undeserving people like the people in our world, like you and me? How could it be possible that a way, a door, could be made for all people to have eternal righteous and right living with God. But you see, Jesus made the unexpected mission that we can now expect. He made the impossible mission a mission that is not only possible, but is promised for us. So being good Lutherans, then we ask, what does this mean? What does this mean? First of all, it means stop trying to walk through the walls. Stop trying to walk through the walls. For our sake and for Christ's glory, use the door. Sin and guilt have such huge burdens. Bags of trash that we continue to carry throughout our lives. Most of them are things that we have brought upon ourselves. Some are thrown upon us by the words and actions of others. But why do we continue to carry them? When we realize and acknowledge our sin and our unworthiness, it's important that we bring them to the door. And at the door, Jesus tells us, friend, that trash doesn't belong in the banquet hall. That trash doesn't belong in the banquet hall. You have to leave it behind. I'll take care of it for you. Leave it with me. You see, it's God's forgiveness in Christ Jesus that opens the door every day for real and genuine living. And sickness and death, two other tragic realities of this sinful world in which we live. Many of us have uh, lived through the feelings of helplessness and hopelessness as loved ones battled illnesses uh, which could not be conquered. Uh, as we've sat with them, been with them, and we see one door after another of offering hope to provide healing, one door after another is slammed shut. But thank God, he has given us the assurance of an open door beyond all illness and far beyond the power of death. When it comes time for us to go through that door, Jesus will tell us, my friend, all of these illnesses, all those sicknesses, they don't belong in a banquet hall. They don't belong in a banquet hall. Leave them at the door. I'll take care of them for you. Leave them with me. Years ago, a good friend by the name of Don Brockman was in a hospital with a severe respiratory uh, disease. And as I visited him in the hospital, he told me that earlier that day, a very well-meaning friend uh, had come by to visit with him, and she was so excited. 
and she told John, Don, said, Don, uh, I had a dream last night, and in that dream, God told me that you were going to be completely healed within the next couple of days, and you're going to go back home in perfect health and back to work and doing all the other activities uh, that you uh, enjoy doing. And she was so excited. Uh, so uh, when I had come to visit, this friend had already left, and Don told me after uh, speaking about this experience, he said, Pastor, I know that God will give me complete healing, but I also know it will not be in this life. It'll be on the other side of the door. It will be on the other side of the door. In our times of helplessness and hopelessness, the only real hope that we have is Jesus the door, who has life ahead of us, far beyond our sins, and also beyond the door of this sinful world. And the second thing, what does this mean? Jesus is the door. Jesus is the door. We dare not slam the door shut in the faces of others, no matter how different they might be from us. We are not the ones who stand at the door in charge of opening it or closing it. That's Christ's job. That's his job. The mission that he gives us is to help people who are trying to walk through the walls and point and direct them to Jesus the door. The narrow door that opens up to forgiveness and eternal life. The one who truly is <clears throat> the door of hope and living. So people of God, people whose faith is in Jesus, the door. Mission unexpected. Mission impossible. At times it may seem that way with us too, or to us. All peoples excluded by their sin, but included by God's grace. That's far beyond our expectations, certainly beyond our capabilities. But by God's grace and his power, that's the mission he now gives us. The mission that he has already made possible through his son Jesus. May God the Holy Spirit then fill us with hope and life so that we might point people to the door to Jesus in whom everyone has forgiveness and life. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.